Most of the time when we're working with image compression, we are using software or programming languages to analyze those images. Now, I'm using Python, I'm using Jupyter Notebook here as my platform. And just to kind of run through this to show you that this is not black magic, it's not mystical or esoteric, we're doing some very linear algebraic operations here. Now, the first thing we need to do is just import some packages. And if you're not familiar with programming, all this means is that we need to access the right libraries to access the right functions to do what we want. So what I'll go ahead and do is just run that cell. What that will do is just load all of those packages. Nothing happens. Next thing we want to do is we want to load the image. So I'm going to store the image in something called IMG. It's a variable name. And it's going to access this function from this package that we've imported, image.open. And I have this image stored in a particular, on a particular path in a directory. And so I'm going to access that image. Then I'm going to run this plt.figure. And what that does is it just creates a, a blank figure um, that's going to be a size 9, 9 by 6. And then I'm going to show the image. So plt.im show, that's a function, and it will show the image stored in IMG. So if I run this, there we go. There's our image. And this is a, the cover of linear algebra and its applications. And now, in order to actually work with this, since this contains three layers, three matrices that are roughly however many pixels by however many pixels this is, I can go ahead and determine that. Actually, before we do that, we have to uh, convert this image into a matrix. Right now, it's just being represented as, as a picture. And I know that's kind of weird to understand at the moment, but we have to actually convert this to a numerical uh, array. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to run this uh, image.convert. So I'm going to create a new image out of the old image. And this is just going to be creating a grayscale image. So what we'll do is we'll take those three matrices that contain the RGB values, and we're going to kind of compress them into what we call a grayscale image. Uh, I don't entirely know how grayscale is created, but if you'd like to research how we can convert color pictures to grayscale, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay, so that's just the same image, clearly just in what we would call black and white. Next, we want to convert the image to a matrix and show that its values can be rendered as pixel colors. So what we're going to do is we're going to run this function that basically takes the grayscale image and basically takes and converts to There's some weird stuff going on here. We're going to create float values. We're going to uh, create some lists and then convert this into what's called a NumPy array. Then we're going to make sure that in, what will often happens is these, these vectors for the pixels get stacked together in arbitrary ways. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set its shape to be the shape of the original image. And then we're going to convert that to a, a matrix. Then we'll go ahead and show that you can still render that matrix as an image. And so you're not going to see anything different here. That's still just the original image. But now it's actually showing a matrix. It's rendering the matrix values. IMG mat is the matrix version of that image. And now we're actually plotting, we're plotting a, a matrix, which is kind of interesting. All right. So next thing we can do is we can actually show the shape of this thing. We can show how big this matrix is. So our matrix is called IMG mat, IMG mat, and I'll run this dot shape command on it. And this image is 648 by 518 uh, pixels large. Okay, and you can kind of see that here, 648 by 518. Okay, now we're ready to compute the singular value decomposition. And here, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going to store in something called capital U. These are, we're creating these variables called U, sigma, and V. And what we're going to store in those is the output of this function that's, that is standard to the NumPy library, np.linalg.svd. And so what we're going to basically do is have it compute the u, sigma, and v matrices. 
and we're going to store them in these variables. So I'll ne next run that. And that doesn't output anything because it, it's just really creating the storage. Now, what I can do is to show the size of this. So like u.shape, for example, is 648 by 648. And that makes sense because this is a 648 by 518 image. So it's going to be m by m. Now I can do the same thing for sigma. But the interesting thing about sigma is that sigma just is, is a, a, a single, basically array, a single row of all of those eigenvalues of the image map transpose times image map. And so that just contains the 518 square roots of the eigenvalues. And now what I can do is do v.shape, and that's 518 by 518. Now we want to see what happens when we keep certain principal components of that SVD expansion. So here, this might be a little bit difficult to understand, but what this product is doing here is it's taking the U, some components of the U matrix, so only retaining certain columns, in other words, the PIs that we want for, this, for the number of terms that we want to keep, times the sigma matrix or, or the eigenvalues, the square roots of the eigenvalues, a certain number of them, multiplied by the V transpose vector. Now, in this case, I have term number set to one, and this will only keep the first term. And then I want to show that image once again. So this is the original image in grayscale form. If I now run this cell, that is the cover of this textbook that is produced when I only keep the first principal component. Now, I'm going to uh, try to get this to be the same size. Let's see. OK, there we go. Now it's the same size. And you can see that it's a very blurry image because it's an approximation with only the first principal component. Now, that's not a good enough representation. You wouldn't want to send that to anybody. Yes, that is very little data to have to send. The first sigma, the first p vector, and the first v transpose vector. But that's not, not enough, right? That's, we have the advantage of sending very little data, but we have the disadvantage of not producing a quality image. So maybe I, I keep the first two sigmas and see what happens. Now that's getting a little bit better, but not quite. So let's see what happens if I keep the first three. All right, kind of getting there. Let's go to the first five. All right, we're starting to be able to make out this, this bottom. We're starting to make out the title. We're, we're able to see a little bit more than we were before. Let's see what happens if I keep the first 10. Well, we're getting there. Now we can see the title a little bit better. We, we still can't read it. Let's bump this up to 20 and see what happens. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a pretty decent representation of the cover of this textbook. But you know, maybe we, we still want to go a little bit higher. So let's double this up and see what 40 would look like. And that is much better. So if you just wanted to say, hey, this is this is the uh, this is the textbook I'm using and you wanted to send this cover off to somebody, then this would be good enough. And in terms of the number of values that we'd have to keep, well, each sigma requires one value. In this case, since the p vectors are all 648 by 1, and the v transpose vectors are all 1 by 518, 648 plus 518 plus 1 that's 1,167 values that would need to be send, sent per principal component multiplied by the 40 principal components that we're sending. That's 46,680 values that need to be sent. The original image, which is 648 by 518, that requires 335,664 values to be sent. That it represents dividing that by 46,680, 
That is, the original image is, requires seven, over seven times more values than this approximation right here. Now, lastly, I just have a, a little loop here that will basically display all of the images from uh, one singular value all the way up to 40 singular values in, in multiples of five. So this would be sending one, this would be sending six, 11, 16. You can see that progressively they're getting better as the number of terms increases. And if I make that even higher, say 101, then this will just produce all of those different covers so that we have them for comparison purposes. So as we're sending more and more of those principal components, the quality of that image gets better. But you can see after a certain point, the gain in quality is not that much, or at least not significant enough to perhaps where we, you know, after a certain number of principal components, we can hardly tell the difference between those images. And this is where it comes in handy. If you're going to send a small image, then not keeping every single principal component has the advantage of not having to send too much data. The very, very last thing here is let's take a look at the different sigmas based on this, the I value. In other words, this is going to go from zero to, or from one to the number of eigenvalues, which is one to 518. And you can see that the first sigma is really large. It's really quite large. That has the biggest contribution in terms of its principal component. And as you start incorporating up to right around, I don't know, that looks like about 75, it pretty much flatlines from there. The remaining sigmas start to have very, very little influence. So up to that 518th term, it wouldn't really make sense to keep it because from about 200 to 518, we see that the sigmas are all pretty much, are very, very close to zero. They contribute very little to the approximation of the image. And so this is how singular value decomposition actually renders images.